Hello everyone, today is Thursday, May 21st, 2020, and this is the week in charts. I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. Looks like our numbers are continuing to climb, which is exciting for me. More and more people are finding the show. I got a few write-ins this week, which is great. Ideally, if you write something, or write in, in other words, email me or something, I'll be happy to cover it. It's great to have uh, things to cover in the show, so I know what to cover. Ideally, though, I'd like you to attend the show, too. That way, I can address any questions, and, and that'll make more sense when we get to those. So what are we talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously. Your questions on trading, try to keep them on the slides if you don't mind. So my ADD doesn't kick in. Your favorite stock picks, wait until we get the live charts from that for that. And then if you don't mind, ask about one stock at a time. You can ask about as many as possible, and that's for your benefit. So we're going to focus on. Well, I this morning I went in and said, look, I, there's a couple things I want to show them this week on volatility. And as usual, I got in that hole, and and before you know it, three or four hours later, I was still in the volatility hole. But I think that I've got enough research now to where I could just show you a chart or two based on the couple of things that we've covered before. And I do think it's it's very viable to wrap your head around volatility. And I'm going to show you a few things that concern to uh, to it and, and that you should know but don't get caught up in a in a holy grail hunt with it because it can be again a bit of a rabbit hole and that'll make more sense as we get to it there's a disclaimer screen as you know you can lose money trading or as often sum it up all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then stealing a line from my friend greg morris I have been doing these bear market updates, but lately with the market trading mostly sideways, at least the S&P and the NASDAQ continue to chug along, I haven't seen the need to do as many of them as of late. But do check back often there. Now, let's get back to our little volatility discussion. Last several weeks, I've been talking about the fact that the volatility curve has been flattening. Now, what does that mean? Well, several things. One thing it means is that the market has begun to trade sideways. In other words, it's range bound. Now, as I often preach, indicators don't indicate anything. Somebody will try to sell you some proprietary indicator claiming it's the be all end all. Well, you know, if I had that be all end all, trust me, I wouldn't sell it. <laughs> I keep it for myself because I'm a greedy bastard, right? And most people are. But indicators do kind of help to alert you to things. And I like to call an indicator an illustrator because it illustrates what's going on in the market. And as you can see, it's going sideways as of late. The other thing that's of interest, as I've been pointing out quite a bit, and I added this little field to my chart recently, or fairly recently, I should say. And I used to spend a lot of time working with it. And then for some reason, it dropped off. And then I'm, now I'm back in that volatility rabbit hole. But this is the six day versus the 50 day volatility rating. And that has dropped off significantly. And I'll explore this a little further in just one second. But right now we're about 40%, which means that we could see a sizable move soon in the market. Now there is some aberrations to that, which I'll explain in one second. So like we said last week, just to go through these quickly, the fact that volatility is beginning to flatten out, what does that mean? What well, means conditions are changing? Obviously, conditions are always changing, right? But now it means that the market is sort of settling into a bit of a range, at least bases the S&P 500. And we'll take a look at everything else in a few minutes. Now, there's a chance of a large move as volatility dries up. So a chance of a large move increases as volatility begins to dry up. Unfortunately, it can dry up for a long time. So that's kind of hard to time off of. One thing of interest though, is that the first move is often a false one. And said alternatively, the second move should it occur is the real move. So if we get a breakout to the upside, followed by a breakout to the downside, that breakout to the downside could be the real deal. Now this is the six day versus the 50 day volatility reading. And usually when it drops below 50, a large move is imminent. Maybe imminent is not the correct word to use because there are a few aberrations in what's going on. 
But as a general statement, when that volatility does drop below 50% of its longer term reading, you would expect a bit of a reversion to the mean move in volatility and then in price itself. Now, as I said a second ago, one thing that I've observed over the years, and sometimes you could just look at a plain old base, you don't even need the volatility reading. If a market breaks out of the base of the upside, then takes out the downside of that base, that could actually be the true move. And vice versa is true too. You take out the bottom of the range first and then reverse back up. And when it takes out the top of the range, that'll actually test out longer term. So one thing we need to watch for is a fake out breakout in the S&P 500. Now, it's complicated, and I don't know if you've picked that up so far, but if not, I'll explain that a little bit. We could have a bit of an aberration of the volatility dropping so low because of the drop-off effect, and I'll show you that in one second. The other thing to remember is that volatility can dry up for a long time, meaning that you could end up with low volatility readings and nothing actually happens. Now. It is hard to time with volatility, as I've said before, and I'll show you some cases where it looks pretty damn impressive. But even though it can be hard to time with, it's still useful as long as you keep a couple of caveats in mind and keep an open mind, like everything when it comes to markets. Now, let's talk about this drop-off effect. So the 50-day, and that was what I was using earlier for my flattening of the curve. And by the way, without showing you how little I know about statistics, the historical volatility, and some people call it statistical volatility, is just the, the bell curve thing on where the market's going to end up based on a two standard deviation bell curve. And so that's what, 66%. So the market has a 66% chance of being 65% higher or 65% lower a year from now. So it's an annualized type of measurement. But as I said last week, if you follow that as gospel, that assumes that A, all things are constant. And what did we just say a few minutes ago? All things are constantly changing. Okay. So you could throw that out the window as far as using HV to tell you where a market's going to be. And it assumes a normal distribution. Okay and markets are not normally distributed. Markets adhered to statistics, whoever had the biggest computer would win the game and then they would no longer be markets. I've actually met some people in my life, one in particular that came up with something in options and a large firm bought it from him for a sizable sum. But if you talk to him, he says it's a billion dollar mistake because what they did was they immediately took the edge and they applied it so hard to the market, the edge came out of the market. But that's a, that's a study for a different day. So if you're using volatility, it is useful to let you know how the market has been behaving. And that's why they have the word historical in it. So the 50-day has been dropping off. But notice that if you take like a 45-day or a 40-day, notice that those have really begun to implode. And that's because you're dropping off this higher volatility type of market, that big slide, and you're adding in more of this sideways market. So more of this and a lot less of that. And that's why the volatility has begun to drop off. So we're just beginning to peel off those crazy, crazy days we had 50 days ago and add in some flatness here, mostly flatness. It doesn't feel like flatness when futures are up 100 points pre-market and markets bouncing around two and three and four points, four percent, four percent a day. But believe it or not, it's less than it was. Now, if we take that to an extreme and take a look at a very short-term volatility, such as three-day five day, six day, 10 day, and compared to the longer term volatility, which has just begun to really implode, you could see that that three day had an extreme spike of 160 and change, followed by a five day spike, a six day spike, a 10 day rollover, and then a 20 day 
rollover. So those numbers dropped sharply. Now, one of the things that I noticed is that in going back and doing this volatility study, a rabbit hole, if you prefer to call it that, is when I was looking at the 50-day volatility, I'd see it peak out, but it seemed to be really slow to peak out at those bottoms. But when I went ahead and started messing around a little bit more with this, I noticed that the short-term volatility readings were quick to spike. And in some cases, as you'll see, help you to see when a bottom occurs. So speaking of that, one thing that I've learned over the years is that markets bottom on high volatility, or should I say markets tend to vol bottom on high volatility. And there's a little bit of a caveat there, and we'll explore that. But let's take a look at the recent peak and the shorter term volatilities, the way it just worked out on the, the chart below, or pretty much in order from the shortest to the longest. And so you can see that three day peak followed by the five day and six day and 10 day and 20 day began to implode right as the market bottomed. In fact, it lines up fairly perfectly with the market bottom. So that's pretty cool, right? Now let's go back to the last low that I've been talking about quite a bit, the December 2018 low. And notice that the peak and the short-term volatilities peaked out really nicely, right precisely at the bottom in December of 2018. That's pretty cool. And that's the kind of stuff, when you're looking at volatility, it just gets your heart pumping and gets you excited. I know, you want to party with me, right? All well, this historical volatility. Well, let's not start kissing each other just yet. So when you start going back in time, you're going to find some beautiful peaks right at bottoms, but you're also going to find some times where it peaks out and it's a bottom, but it's not necessarily the bottom, and you might have another bottom in the future, obviously. So 2002, 2003, it was cool because it peaked out right at a bottom, but it wasn't, it turned out to not be the bottom but that's okay because that was a process bottom which i'll explain a little bit further as we get into this so if we go back to the bear market of 2009 you can see we peaked out in volatility at least on the short term reading okay and it turned out to be a bottom but not the bottom now do we toss it all out no because at least it does help us to find a bottom. And when you're at a bottom, you don't know if it's gonna be the bottom, but that's a time where you might wanna make sure you're trailing those stops lower on your shorts, okay? And if you start seeing some transitional type of setups on the long side, you might think, well, this market is trying to bottom in here, possibly it might be time to go ahead and start thinking about those type of setups. So it can give you a bit of a warning. Now, one little caveat here, and there are some indicators where, or that are completely in hindsight. For instance, like zigzag, you don't know that last leg until you actually, until it actually happens, okay? So a lot of times somebody will look at a chart with zigzag on it, which is something kind of fun to play with. It's just based on a percentage move and it draws a line up and down. Again, another rabbit hole, possibly, if you're doing that. But you got to be careful with something like that because it doesn't draw it until it completes the percentage move. So it's in complete hindsight. Now, the volatility readings are in real time, but you don't know that 165, as crazy as that sounds for a shorter term volatility reading, is going to be the peak until after the fact. But getting back to those charts, you do know that they have possibly peaked out when you see all the volatility begin to implode. But just be careful at lining up any indicator, not just volatility, but be careful with lining up any indicator with the bottom of the chart, with the top of the chart, because you might not know or you won't know if that bottom peak, which perfectly aligns with the bottom of the chart, let me draw that out because I'm 
fumbling around a little bit with my words here. So the point I was making is, or trying to make at least, let's say the the market's coming down like this, and then you come in here and you see a peak in volatility. Well, you don't know that this is a peak until after the peak occurs, okay? Until somewhere over here. So the point I'm trying to make, or was trying to make is, be careful when you line up that indicator perfectly with the bottom of the chart. There's been many a times back in the day when I would see something like that, get all excited, and then when you zoom in the chart, you'll see that the peak might not line up perfectly with the chart up top. The chart might actually be way over here somewhere before the actual bottom was made. And the other thing too is, again, you don't know the peak. Somebody recently was saying that all markets bottom after a certain thing happens, after it rallies up a certain amount, all bottom all markets bottom. Well, that's been true, but sometimes they might rally up past that level, go down and make new level, new lows again. And then when you do have the bottom in perfect hindsight, then yeah, by all means, that level could be bought. But the point I'm trying to get to again is that it's complicated. And then also some things aren't known until hindsight. So whenever you're doing your research, just make sure you play devil's advocate to make sure what you're seeing is not in complete hindsight. By the way, one thing that I do occasionally do when you're doing that kind of research is just do the walk forward testing one day at a time. When you look at the big picture of everything, you see everything lining up perfectly and you think about how rich you're gonna get, keep in mind the real world's more complicated, but if you're walking through it one day at a time, you get to see it sort of in real time, so to speak, even though in the back of your mind, you know what's gonna happen. At least you could be a little bit more objective in what you're seeing. Now, again, like I said, started out early, early this morning. I wanted to do a couple slides on volatility and then maybe get into some psychology and stuff and a bunch of other things. And before you knew it, I'm spending hours and hours and hours on volatility. So it can be a rabbit hole, but just know that markets tend to bottom on high volatility. And here's the good news when a market doesn't bottom on high volatility, that becomes a process bottom. I actually sort of prefer a process bottom because you end up with other signals and much less urgency. The 2002, 2003 bottom, although it was painful to live through that two years while the market bottomed, the beauty was you ended up, ended up with a weekly bow tie and you knew, or at least you had a pretty good feeling like, okay, well, it looks like we're done with this bear market, at least for now, we're getting these longer term signals. Turn your speakers up, Stuart. Stuart has lost sound. <laughs> well, I have it on my end. The good news is the recordings are fairly robust. Now, peaks aren't known exactly as they occur, and that's what I just was trying to say. So there is always a potential of a little bit of hindsight. But if you are watching it, and I am pretty excited about this short-term stuff that I started messing around with. Again, you got to be careful not to turn into a holy grail. But I think if I see the three-day and the five-day and the six-day volatility spike up in the 150s to 180s, or I think the three-day hit 165, if I see those extreme, extreme readings, I'm not going to necessarily try to catch the bottom in the market, but I might be more inclined to make sure I'm A, not putting on any fresh shorts unless I think I have the mother of all setups, B, I'm trailing my stops lower, C, I'm taking partial profits as offered. In other words, I'm going to be a lot more prudent. Now, keep in mind, I kind of laid out the scenario of a fake out breakout or a fake out breakdown, if you want to call it that, in the S&P 500. I'm not necessarily predicting that. What I'm saying is if that occurs, pay attention, okay? Because Sometimes that first move can be a false move, and sometimes it's a key word in that sentence. Now, last week, we talked about the weekly bow tie, and the market has improved quite a bit over the last week. One thing of interest, 
as I've been saying, is obviously you know, people ask me all the time, hey, can you tell me exactly where you would be bearish, exactly where you'd be bullish? And it's like, well, it's not that easy. But if you're looking at something like a weekly bow tie, if we go above, let's say, 3,000 or 29.50 and change, then that would be good in Tarzan speak. We introduced Tarzan a few weeks ago. And if we drop below that level, that would be not good in Tarzan speak. Now, all joking aside, if we pick that apart a little bit, there are some very interesting things that are happening. As I've said before, thanks to my buddy Greg Morris, who taught me this, when a market closes above an exponential moving average, and it doesn't matter how long that exponential moving average is, even if, it, even if it's an, or a 100-day or a 500-day exponential moving average, that moving average will turn up. Now, it's a little hard to see, but if you did the actual math on it, any close above an exponential moving average would cause that exponential moving average to be greater than it was one period ago. So as long as we stay at this 2950 level or higher, these moving averages are going to turn up. The other thing that's gonna happen is that simple moving average, and if I'm using these stock charts, charts, you could always look over here to see what the moving averages are. A little uh, trick there, a little tip there. And these are the bow tie moving averages, 10 simple. If it just says MA, it's simple. EMA is exponential and 30 is exponential. But if we can hover around here a little while longer, thanks to the drop off effect, this 10 simple moving average is gonna catch up the price really quick. So what will eventually happen, as long as we stay above these moving averages, what eventually happen is, will happen is these moving averages will cross back to the upside to negate that weekly signal. Now. I beat the dead horse in this quite a bit, but obviously when you have a weekly signal on a bow tie, it can be very concerning because pretty much every bear market, I think in history has started at least with a, a weekly bow tie or usually some other signal too, either or, but not every signal turns into the mother of all bear markets, but I think it pays to pay attention when that happens. So again, as long as you stay above 29.50, the market is improving. Any EMA crossing will cause the EMA to turn. So if you want to go back, and I'm just kind of seeing this, I saw it back in the day, back when it happened. But if you wanted to go back in and look at the charts, it's kind of interesting as I'm doing this presentation, I'm reminded of it, what happened when the market began to crack back in late February. Well, we closed obviously below these moving averages. And if we take a look at the red one, which is the 30 and the blue one, which is the 20, what happened with the moving average? Well, the moving average was here, closed below, and now it's here, okay? It was here and then now it's here. So you can see that that slope has changed just by the price crossing below it. Now, sometimes the simple moving average will have some lag. So this simple moving average was headed lower, but what was price doing, okay? So it's heading lower from here all the way down. Price was actually going up, okay? And it wasn't until this day, actually not even there yet, pretty much until now to where this moving average actually turned up. So you can see a lot of lag and that's simple, but that's okay. I like the way the exponentials behave around a simple moving average. And that's just by accident the way I discovered the bow ties. And by the way, I like the I like using shorter term moving averages. I like using simple shorter term moving averages and exponential longer term moving averages, unless we're looking at something that's well watched, like the 50-day simple and a 200-day simple moving average. And we'll take a look at those. When we get to the charts. So obviously moving averages will turn up when price crosses above them. And if you just look back the last week, and this is a daily snapshot here, today notwithstanding, the market has moved substantially higher. So 
obviously week over week, things are improving. Now, last week and a few weeks before, I began questioning, will the old leaders become the new laggards? And a poster child for that would be Zoom. And it depends on what kind of metrics you want to look at. But if you look at like a, a head and shoulder top, possibly could be in the works or a big rounded top. Or maybe something I haven't had a lot of success with, at least I don't trade it outright, but three drives to a high. Or the big blue arrow has begun to point a little sideways. Where are we now? Well, we're at 170, but we're about a little bit above 165, right? Well, where were we way back in March? We were a little bit above 165 or right at 165. So for the most part, you could see that even though longer term, the stock has performed incredibly over the intermediate term, it has gone mostly sideways, okay? So if we drop down a little bit in here, we'll be right where we were way back here last March. So just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind that whatever leads you out of a bear market does not continue to lead you out to the bear market. Now, that doesn't mean that you should stop trading stocks that have momentum. We're looking to get long a health service stock today. We've got a couple of biotechs on the Landry list that we're looking to go after possibly eventually. So it doesn't mean that they've topped out just yet. But I would keep an eye out for when they do begin to top. And if the market continues to do well, just remember those old leaders could become the new laggards. And there's many reasons for this. They could become a source of funds. And I hate to say it, but the theme or whatever may begin to end. For instance, in Zoom, and this is a little bit too logical, which scares me a little bit. But as people go back to work, they're not going to need Zoom as much. And there's a lot of other things that could happen. And one thing that fund managers tend to do is they use these stocks as a source of funds. So they start selling the Zooms and the biotechs and buying up something at much lower levels like the energies. That doesn't unfold overnight, so pay attention. But have that in the back of your mind if this market continues to improve. Now, one thing I was thinking about this morning in, in wrapping my head around everything. And, and I think, you know, last, or actually this morning when I woke up and did my initial writing, every morning I wake up and I write three handwritten pages. And I would urge you to do the same. And I'll probably talk more and more about this. But if you go and look at some of the now columns on my website, davelander.com, I talk a lot about the importance of this. And it was popularized by Julia Cameron. I started doing this. Oh, geez, 20, 30 years ago, maybe even longer. I'm showing my age here. And for some reason, I quit. And I'm sorry that I did. I can't imagine the amount of insight I would have looking backwards. And it would give me so much foresight from that. But I wake up every day and I write three pages. And one of the things that I wrote about this morning was lessons learned from this recent slide. And one of the things was that the volatility became so extreme, I think I might have been hesitant to get into some of these stocks knowing that there's a potential for it to end badly. And I am beginning to see a few debacle de jours, not enough to, to freak out over, but enough to be a little concerned about some of these prior leaders beginning to crack a little bit. And we'll have to see if that puts pressure on the overall market or not. But here's a very volatile stock, and you could see it lost 70 something percent of its value overnight. And there's quite a few stocks that are extremely volatile that could actually have potential moves like that. Now, again, this morning I was thinking that I was a little gun shy on getting in some of these more volatile stocks. And I saw an email from somebody this morning saying that they've held off trading lately because it, the volatility has been so crazy. And I, I can't say that I blame them. And that's kind of where I was about a month or so ago. But now I think you're kind of forced to play the hand that's dealt. And I hope it's I hope I'm not too late to the game in some of these cases. I've had some phenomenal stocks on the Landry list that I think I was a little too gun shy to go after and if you go in i was talking with one of my clients 
uh, yesterday or day before, go in and look at the archives, davelander.com slash archives, and look at what happened in early May. I think right around Cinco de Mayo, somewhere around then, we had some really, really great stocks in the Landry list that just blasted higher. But the volatility was so crazy, I think I might have been a little gun shy on those. So you have to play the hand that's dealt, but you have to respect the risk. And like location, location, location is to real estate, money management, money management, money management is to trading, especially when you're dealing with these super high volatility stocks. Now, this is a setup coming into today. I have working orders in the setup. And the HV is 165. As I told my peeps last night, I don't ever remember, other than a little uranium stock, or it was a rare earth stock, I forget, molybdenum stock, maybe, I can never say that word. I could never remember recommending a stock with an HV that crazily high. Even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous, but that's the hand that we're being dealt now. This is a little health service stock, and it has unbelievably crazy high HV. But the good thing is we do have some structure here. We have a pullback, and A, if it does continue to sell off, hopefully it won't trigger. I know you should never say hope in this business, but hopefully it won't trigger. And B, maybe within that structure, we'll at least get the initial profit target out and be able to trail that stop higher. Now, I want to talk a little bit about discretion as it relates to fast moves on the open. People often ask me, they want exact results of the trading service. And I try to explain to them that it's very hard to lay something out on a complete mechanical basis. I know some people out there, and not to take away from what they do because they're very smart and I listen to them and I pay attention to what they're doing, but it's like they'll show something and say, hey, this looks good. And, and they give you very, 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 very loose parameters. Well, obviously in the trading service, I have to tighten it up a little bit and show, okay, we're gonna get in here, have a stop here, additional profit target here. But you have to give it some wiggle room sometimes on some of these things. So let's say that profit target gets really close but doesn't quite hit, and it just can't seem to get there, as I preach over and over again, you come within sense of that profit target, then by all means, don't split hairs and take the additional profits. Now, on something like this, you got a nice trend higher, you got a pullback. We were looking to get in right about here, okay, just below 43. And that was on a Friday. The stock was still being shown as a potential setup. But what happened on Monday? Well, if you guys go back to the, I think it was the 18th of May. When was that? That was recently, right? We had the few, we came in and futures were up like a hundred points. Absolutely crazy. Okay. So what happens with the stock? Well, you know you're gonna get a fast move on the open because it was getting fairly close to that trigger on a day over day basis. We, the trigger was much higher than where the stock was, but each day the stock got a little closer to hitting that trigger, right? And then we were fairly close coming into Monday. And then what happened? Well, you know, you get a fast move on the open. So I did not put any orders in. And I know some of you did the same and I'm still trying to sort it out who actually got in and who didn't, because I'm just curious. But notice that it found its high within the first five minutes of trading and then began to implode. So in a case like this, a fast move on the open, you would avoid the trade. Now, this is the tricky part. Let me just show you the easy part. Let me show you the tricky part. So the easy part is when you have an entry here, okay, and the stock gaps above that entry and comes right back in. So what do you do in this case? Well, you put a new entry above this high, okay? And then you go have breakfast and relax, okay? A stop entry. But in a case like this, where it opens below the entry, okay? Now keep in mind on a daily chart, this is not quite as extreme. 
And by the way, sometimes what you might want to do just to avoid getting too caught up, let's say this is a daily chart and you have an entry here. Well, on the daily chart, it's going to look like it's going to rally up and look like this. Squint your eyes, you can barely see it, okay? So you might watch a daily chart instead of the intraday chart because when you're looking at this bar, you're like, oh my God, I got to get in. I can't miss it. I can't miss it. But in reality, it's not that big of a deal. Now, getting back to the fast move on the open, this is where it's a little tricky. So it rallies up. It does trigger. So, okay, I'm triggered in. Now I have to make that go or no go decision. So what you can do is just say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to get in if it continues to rally and I'll have some point in mind and you might even put a hard stop in and there's always a chance it'll tag that entry and then come right back in. It happens sometimes twice, <laughs> but you have to have some sort of no or go no or some discipline in place. And again, maybe looking at that daily chart over here, maybe put your, put your order in up here somewhere and it won't stress you out as much as watching that five minute chart. So those fast moves on the open takes a lot of discretion to trade. It takes a lot of discipline to trade, but it can be done. Okay. Hari says, can the rule of thumb be that we should never enter trades in the first five minutes of the day? Unfortunately, Hari, that doesn't work. Okay. So let's just say, let's say our entry was um, was here. Okay. On that first coming into today and let's say this is uh this is a 10 point move okay so you come in and it triggers that first five minute bar it shoots up 10 points but unfortunately comes right back in but if you take an initial profit targets and everything and take a partial profits you actually ended up with a quick little pop and a quick little day trade so unfortunately there's no hard and fast rules like don't trade in the first five minutes because sometimes that market will gap and go, okay? And that's that no or go, no, go decision. Let's let's make it a little bit more obvious. Let's say this is a five minute chart, okay? And then we have an entry here, okay? And let's say it gaps up here. Well, okay, we know there's a good chance it could come right back in like this, right? But if it continues to rally, you have to make that go or no go decision. And let's say we're still in this five minute bar, it could blast through that and just keep on going, okay? So you have to say, well, if it could get, if it continues to rally, I would get at a certain point, a little bit higher than the market and let the market stop us into the trade. So unfortunately, you, it's very hard to make these hard and fast rules, but you can still do fairly well with general rules, provided of course, and here comes trading psychology, we're in its ugly head again, or as usual, provide, of course, you're willing to have the discipline in place to actually follow through with your new plan. Now, the, the thing I like the most, which is absolutely a wonderful thing, and let's see if we can get back to that trade of the day as an example. So in this particular case, and I'm just gonna kind of spitball it here. I don't, I don't have it in front of me because I have actual orders in place. But our entry is, I think it's somewhere in here, okay? And this was coming into today. So here's today's trading. So what did I do? Well, I put in a stop entry order right here and started working or continued working on my weekend chart slides. In other words, went about my life. And that's a stop, a buy stop entry, okay? At that level. And then what's gonna happen if it triggers? where I'm gonna put in a stop at wherever I have that stop outline in the service. Following the trading service is the easiest thing. I know, haha, -ha. it's not always that easy, but when you have a situation like this where you don't have a trigger on the open, there's no discretion involved, I have the plan. Get in at A, play stop at B, and place initial profit target at C. And in some cases, I'll use a limit order for one half. I'm not a huge fan of limit orders, but they can really work out nicely, especially given the volatile nature of this environment and the volatile nature of some of these stocks, because there might be some excitement. This company might come out with whatever. I don't know. I don't care. But they might come out with some sort of breathing device or something that's going to help people live through this horrid disease, right? Okay. And so this stock might just blast through the roof up 10 points. 
blast through the initial profit target or whatever, and then somebody comes out and says, oh, never mind, and it comes right back in. But at least you'll get that initial profit target if you have a limit order in place. So I kind of talked out of both sides of my mouth with the limit orders, but a lot of cases, especially more volatile stocks, more recent times, given the spiky nature, I have been using them. The whole point I was trying to make with this is when you're able to follow that exact plan and you don't have to use discretion, that's when trading is at its easiest. And it's great because with the trading service, I have the plan in place and all I have to do is follow it. And a lot of times I'll just, I have multiple screens and on my one screen, I'll have my trading service up and it's like, I walk over to my quote screen. It's like, oh, okay, I'll just put the orders in, simpler. On other stocks that I might be interested in Landry lists, I don't always get around, truth be told, to making my trading plan. So all of a sudden I'm like, well, where am I going to get in? Where am I put the stop? How many shares do I need? On that other stuff, it's all laid out for me. So that's the, sort of the purpose of the trading service from a selfish standpoint for my own trading is to lay that plan out completely. So there's no questions during the heat of battle, other than the occasional discretion, as we just discussed, as to what to do and i probably should be putting any other trades into that spreadsheet that i'm going to take so there's less and less questions and you know you make me reason one reason i have the educational business is it forces me to do a desk ton of research a lot more than i'd probably do if i was just on my own and also it forces me to want to become better you make me want to be a better person and it helps me out tremendously if you aren't a member of DaveLandry.com, a gold member, then you need to become a member and you need to make sure you join the Facebook group. I have loved this group. I have learned from you guys. I am doing a lot of research based on you guys. And it's just been a wonderful thing for me. My, my wife said, that's been the best thing you've ever done, Dave, is start that Facebook group. And it's been great interacting with you guys. And, and you know, I have to thank you guys because a lot of you are here today. So I thank you. I see you guys chime in when somebody asks a question. I was, I have somebody I'm doing a little business with locally and he's just beginning to trade. And I told him to come in and join the Facebook group. And he's like, well, I, you know, I really don't know what I'm doing. Is it okay? I'm like, absolutely come in. He says, I'm going to be nervous putting anything. I said, don't worry about it. Go through all the courses. And when you think you're ready, it, feel free to throw out some trades and said, we'll help you out. So it's okay to ask for help in there. And then you could see signs and signals. And occasionally, like this morning, I'll throw out an opening gap reversal. Some of them work and some of them fail miserably. But for more on the opening gap reversals, go to the members area and go into the Q&A. We talk about them quite a bit. So here's two URLs you can get started for free. You won't have access to the Facebook group unless you're a gold member, but at least you can get in and start poking around a little bit and see some of the things that are there. Okay, let me go to, let's switch gears here. Let's get to the live charts. And what I wanna do first is take a look at the overall market. And then after that, I want to, obviously, we'll take a look at your favorite stock picks and anything else market related. And you can ask any question you want now. We'll see what we can get done. And I'm just trying to get my screen shared. Okay, okay, do it. Okay, let's get to the P's, the S&P 500. And then let's take a look at what else is happening. So all that talk we just had about the range coming into today, let's back out one day. That looked fantastic, right? We're getting to break out the range. If only trading was as simple as, let's just buy the breakout, right? Unfortunately, it's not that easy. As you can see, we're coming back in a little bit, but you know, we're off our worst levels here. Certainly not the end of the world and certainly the market has been improving. One thing I'm a little concerned about is so far the S&P 500 has a big picture retrace rally to it. Sometimes the market will sell off hard, retrace sharply and then roll back over. I was thinking this morning, the it's, it's hard to explain because it's like, but Dave, I thought you were a trend follower. It's like, yeah, I am. But the market's up 30%. It is, but it still looks like a big retrace. If this market was at major, major, major lows, okay, and stayed there for a while and then rallied 30%, I would be much more excited about it 
then this huge sell-off we've had, okay, and then this big old V-shaped recovery. But hey, one day at a time, stranger things have happened. Obviously, 2018, we came flying off of those lows and did really, really well. So I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully, okay, the market will continue to go higher. I'm seeing a dichotomy, as I've been saying quite a bit, between good stocks and bad stocks. And I'm not seeing a lot of shorts, just given the nature of the way the methodology works. But for the most part, those longs are looking pretty good, like the one I just showed you in the slides. And I'm going to go after those. And if they fail miserably, they fail miserably. And if the market fails miserably, then it does fail miserably. That's It is what it is. But for now, I think it's worth going after some of those momentum stocks. Somebody asked me a week or two ago, Dave, are you bullish now? Why are you bullish all of a sudden? It's like, well, because I'm seeing stocks set up. I'm seeing stocks go up. I'm seeing some of these biotechs take off. It might be worth a shot going after some of them. And we'll we'll flesh out a few of them. I see we're getting a couple of them coming into the Q&A. We'll get to those. I appreciate it. Keep, keep them coming in just a few minutes. So a little bit of stalling action here. Not the end of the world. I hope... But believe me, I'd much rather the market go up than go down. It's a lot easier to make money on the long side than the short side. The short side, one of my regrets, and, and there's nothing I really could have done about it other than hindsight that I was thinking about this morning, is we had this sharp sell-off in the overall market. We had this beautiful little first thrust down. We had this little gap here, everything, reversal gap strategy, first thrust down, daily bow tie, weekly sell signal, and the TFM 10% system. All these sell signals coming in, every gosh darn stock in the world was set up, and we were only able to fire off a few shorts because it all triggers at the same time. And the scary part about that is if you get too aggressive, let's say you go after 10 stocks, they all trigger, and then the market says a big has a big do-over, goes straight back up, and then you're a hurt and pop. So short side is tough. Long side, you know, it's kind of like the little uh price is right, man. You know, what's what's what do you call that? What's the name? little mountain guy right you know so you're on the long side and and here's the market going back you know several months you know doo -doo 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 you know you got time to get long you take a profits getting knocked out a couple hey i like this stock looks good the overall market's doing good you got the tailwind behind you, you know doo -doo 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 -doo. just keeps doing this right and then unfortunately eventually what's it do <laughs> But you could see it could it could it could do that little uh, what's that little yoga man call on Price is Right? I used to watch that as a kid when I would pretend to be sick. <laughs> anyway, it could go up for a long, long time, and it, it's just a it's it's so much easier. It's not easy, but it's so much easier. I remember all the bio uh, the uh, not the biotechs they could have been biotechs, but all the little IPOs that were setting up and breaking out and do all these wonderful things during this nice longer term uptrend. Well, on the short side, you've got one day to get in, right? And then the thing immediately implodes, okay? So anyway, S&P 500, uh, kind of beat the dead horse here, stuck in a range for now, but hey, at least we're starting to peep up towards the top of the range. About a week ago or so, it looked a little bit different. Looks like we we're gonna try to challenge the bottom of that range, but so far so good. NASDAQ has been super duper impressive defying gravity. And as I think I said this morning, the market in a minute and lately, how incredible would that be if we went on to make new highs, given all the stuff going on in the world? It's like the whole world's coming unglued, <laughs> and the NASDAQ makes brand new highs. That would be just be a wonderful thing. I think psychologically that would be impressive. The only thing that scares me from a trend trader's perspective, okay, is that, or a trader's perspective, I should say, is that these V-shaped recoveries at high levels can be hard to sustain. So the market sells off, implodes like this, and it comes back up here. Well, by the time we get all the way back up here, okay, the market is already very, 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 very overbought. And as I often say, it's hard to run a race right after you have ran a race. So if I was betting on a runner and I would look at the stats or whatever, and it's like, okay, this guy's won every marathon in the world. 
and he was going to run a marathon this afternoon, I don't want to bet on the same guy if he ran a marathon this morning, okay? So hopefully that makes a little sense. That's the only thing that scares me a little bit. I much prefer when the market goes down and bottoms out for a long, long time and then begins to fly off the lows. And I know I've said that a few times already today. So that's the NASDAQ composite. Trend until proven otherwise is obviously up, okay? Again, concerned that we might not get past these old highs, but I hope we do. Here's a rusty, rusty, not doing a whole lot today. Rusty's been crazy volatile. We had a 6% up day the other day, followed by a 3% down day, okay? Kind of stuck in a range. Retrace a little bit more obvious here. You got this huge slide and then it retraces back up. I'm not a fan. Well, not that I'm not a fan. I don't know a lot about it, but I know uh, just through annual meetings and stuff through the AAPTA, the the Wyckoff people call out the automatic rally. So you have a sharp sell-off and then you sort of have this bounce or automatic rally, whatever you want to call it. And that's kind of what that looks like now. While we're up here, let's take a look at gold. Gold imploding a little bit today. My big concern with gold, now this is a commodity, commodity and maybe this is the example that V-shaped thing. V-shaped recovery at high levels. It was off to the races and then just began to meander, tried to break out again, and then it's now come back in. It's not the end of the world here, but we have lost a little bit of steam. And that's been the problem with the gold stocks is they kind of went straight up and none of them really set up. And maybe with today's pullback, there'll be some interesting stock setting up soon. Cliffhanger, is that price is right? The little yodeling man or whatever? <laughs> I use that analogy in so many different things. Now, as we look through the sectors, as I've been saying quite a bit, there's a bit of a dichotomy that's happening. Drugs recently broke out, coming back in a little bit, V-shaped recovery problem, okay? But they seem to have a tailwind or a hurricane behind them. Same thing with biotech, V-shaped recovery, but kind of hanging in there, you know? And then health services didn't quite make it back to the old highs. I sure would like to see it make it back there. That's that V-shaped recovery stalling short of the prior high, so that's got me a little bit concerned. But overall, health services still doing pretty good. On an individual basis, doing really well. One thing I preach is believe in what you see, not in what you believe. If you'd ask me back in March where retail would be, I would draw my big blue arrow and say, well, it's going to be lower. And then confusing the issue with facts, I'm like, duh, look at what's going on, okay, in the world and in your neighborhood, unfortunately, but retail has gone up. It is what it is. It's another one of those V-shaped recoveries at high level levels that has me a little concerned, but from a standpoint of relative strength, retail, which seems kind of crazy, right, is actually headed higher and looking pretty good. So as you go through these, you'll see it's kind of mixed. Transport's not doing as well as a lot of the other areas. Banks haven't been doing so hot as of late. You can see that their little automatic rally or a bump from lows or dead cat bounce from lows, whatever you want to call it, has been a little bit on the anemic side. Ditto for insurance, although it looks a little bit more impressive, but not much. Real estate sort of defied gravity for a while, but it has that retrace rally to it. So it's kind of like I said last week, it's like the blind man feeling up on the elephant. You know, it's a wall. It's a tree, it's a rope, you know, it's it's whatever you want it to be depending on where you look. So that retrace thing I've been talking about, which the NASDAQ didn't seem to care, went straight up. S&P is there, may or may not roll over, we don't know yet, but real estate did roll over, banks did roll over, insurance did roll over, okay? So not all is great with this market, it's certainly not firing on all eight cylinders, but does that matter? And I'm going to say, well, ideally, it'd be great if it was, but I'm going to say, well, we want it ideally to be firing on all eight cylinders, but I think we have to play the hand that's dealt, and I think we have to go after these momentum stocks. All right, anything else you guys want me to look at with the overall market before we hop into the individual stock questions? <laughs> You know, well, that's good, though. Okay, Chris says, shameful stock I got trapped in, but looking better. S-E-E-O. Okay, so admitting bad behavior, that's that's the first, that's the first sign of 
or first epiphany, I should say, of becoming a, a, a better trader, okay? Is admitting when you're doing something stupid. I don't like being wrong, okay? And, and I didn't know that I, I was low in agreeableness, as I've said a thousand times, until I took a personality test and scored like a zero in agreeableness. <laughs> Told my wife and kids, and they looked at me like I pooed my pants. I'm like, I, hey, can you believe this? I thought I was the most agreeable guy on the planet. Don't you agree? Well, and that makes it hard for me to trade because I want the market to agree with me. Well, we all want the market to agree with me, with us, I should say, not me, but with us. But that's the hard part about trading is you're going to be wrong a lot. You have to learn to embrace that and accept that. But yeah, this is certainly improving. It's a little cheapy. I'd be really careful with anything down below five bucks a share or whatever, but it certainly has that Phoenix stock look to it, bottoming out longer term. I bet you 50 bucks. Oh, is this not going to work? Oh, crap. We got a hot key. So I can't get the boat. To, it, you know, they change things up every week, and that just pisses me off. So I can't throw the bow ties in here on the fly because now we have a hot key for my bow tie key. But anyway, probably a bow tie up to the upside. We'll have, yeah, it's a bow tie, Chris. Okay, so Chris confirms it is a bow tie. This is a write-in, and I see you're here today, Elizabeth. That's fantastic. Yeah, if you do a write-in, that's great if you come here and, and for the show. Okay, the question is, Lynn, I asked, I know I asked you about this one last week, and you were, quote, not excited. I did anyway, by a little, at 52.38, L-E-N. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, I wasn't ex super excited about this because you're you're buying into this retrace, okay, rally, a bigger picture retrace here. I would much rather something that had the potential to to take off into clean air. Let me show you the missed trade of the century, okay? Let's back this out. So I saw this a, when a while back. This is one of those early May trades I told you to go and look at. You see, you've got a nice accelerated move higher. You got a pullback, and it's nothing but clean air above the market. Okay, so a lot better structure and something like that, as opposed to Lynn, where you don't know whether you're going to have people looking to get out of break even back here or whatever. Now, with that said, the trade worked. Okay, you bought you bought a little at 52.38. Okay, and have a stop at 51.55. Well, you got a free trade. Um, I don't think your stop is necessarily too tight here, okay? I, I would take partial profits if you're six points in the money on the trade and then have that stop at break even. I think that's okay or just around break even. So yeah, look to take partial profits. And you know, people get caught up and you gotta be 100% right, 100% wrong. The gentleman I was talking about earlier who just began the trade, he stopped by yesterday and we were having a conversation, and I made him stay six feet, six or eight feet away. <laughs> I walked into my in-law's house, and they had some of the extended family there on Mother's Day, and they were all like coming up to hug me and shake my hand and all. And I said, six feet, bitches. <laughs> I'm a bit of a germaphobe. Ah, I have, I have a not a close friend, but a friend. I just found out he had it. He had it really bad. They were, it was not looking good for him. So. A little scared about that. But before I digress too far, yeah, start looking to take partial profits on this one. It's definitely not something that I would have gone after for many, many reasons. One, overhead supply and the fact that you don't have the clear air. Same thing, different ways of saying it. But yeah, good job on that one so far. But, you know, in the future, just because it worked doesn't mean it was a, a great trade, a trade to take. I'm not the Grand Pumbaa, believe me. But if I, I am... I do work really hard to try to follow a specific methodology, a little discretion here and, there, here and there as we discussed. And through that methodology, through that lens of my methodology, it would not have been a trade I took. Same question with H-O-L-X. All right, let's take a look at that one. Yeah, see, this is another one that I just can't get excited about. The other thing, too, is it really didn't have a deep enough retrace to it. It just kind of pulled back, a little shallow pullback. Now, here's the issue we could have. I was thinking about this this morning and looking back to some of those early May trades. In some cases, I remember telling my peeps, I wish they had a deeper retrace. I'm not going to go after them. So I don't know if we're going to end up with a market if this thing keeps blowing and going where we have to be willing to get in on stocks that haven't retraced a whole lot. So this one I'm not as excited about. 
5207, a stop at 49. That seems a little tight. That's three points, okay? Let's look at the HV on this, 83. <laughs> Four months ago, I would have said that's ludicrous, 83, okay? And even though I still trade stocks with high HV like that, I'd say, well, we got to be really careful with this one. So three points doesn't seem like a whole lot on a $50 stock. So I think you'll have to give it some room. I just don't like the setup to begin with. I don't see the setup to begin with. So it makes me hard to go in and quarterback something that I wouldn't have taken anyway, okay? AEIS on a pullback, AEIS. Now again, you know, you're know, we're looking at a lot of these stocks with a lot of overhead supply, okay? Let's find something, let's find something in clean air, okay? Well, Dave, what's a clean air? Well, let's, let's, let's just do something for S and Gs. I wonder if I have a tradable universe in here. I don't know how old this one is. I thought I had a newer one. I was doing some research. Let's take a look at like the spiders. Okay, let's just look from the lows to now. Let's do a relative strength sort, okay? And let's see what's out there. All right, here we have a stock, clear air above, okay? Look at that, brand new highs, clear air above. Not so much with that one. But you can see some of these stocks, just clear air above. It's just really take it off nicely. There's another one. So there's so many potential stocks up here, clear air, that one, okay, that have broken out nicely. There's no need to go after mediocre stocks or stocks that are below their prior highs like that one. So just go through your database and look for stocks that are up in clear air. Speaking of clear air, MRNA. Yeah, I'm being asked about that one. Okay, first of all, HV122 which is crazy. This is obviously the vaccine stock. I think, and, and maybe I'm going to be wrong again by wanting a deeper pullback, but I'd like to see a deep, deeper pullback, but absolutely, it's worked its way higher. It's accelerated higher. HV is whack. HV is whack at everything. We're just going to have to live with that, right? But yeah, on a deeper pullback, Stuart, absolutely, absolutely. Just <laughs> have a chair ready for when the, the music stops. RNG, good to go, RNG. Yeah, it's not bad, okay? We didn't, you know, my big concern here is we didn't really clear this prior peak decisively, but it's not bad. I think you could find better, but I certainly can't beat you up too much for trading a pullback that looks like that. Unfortunately, though, it just really didn't clear this, this base too much. And the problem is if it triggers and then comes back in, then you're back in this base and then you're no longer in a trending stock. So focus on the ones that are in clear air. Okay, we got a short coming in, OMCL. I'm gonna say no, because it doesn't really fit the methodology, but as far as a top, let's take a look at this. Yeah, I mean, you know, classical technical analysis looks like the mother of all tops. If it looked like this back here, let's say like on this, like that, that, okay, big slide followed by a little bit of a pullback. I would say that's a short, especially coming off of all-time highs. The only concern though, look at your volume. 300,000 shares on a short side, I prefer stuff with a little bit more volume. ACGL was a big one of our recent shorts. Notice that it came off of all-time highs. It's got an S-ton of volume, okay? A metric S-ton, right? And then triggers a little first thrust, just kind of a textbook type of setup. That's the kind of setup that I'd like as opposed to something that has made that kind of like W shape or whatever you want to call that on the short side. Okay, WST, WST. Yeah, on a pullback. That that looks uh that looks pretty good. It looks pretty fantastic. But yeah, see this is clear air. Who's who asked about this? Chris, Chris A. What's your nickname, Chris? Don't you have a nickname? We've got so many Chris's in the group. <laughs> I get them all mixed up. I'm always like, thank you, Chris, and thinking the wrong Chris. But yeah, I want to pull back. Absolutely. That's gonna that needs to be in your momentum list for sure. Doc you. Yeah, you know, I want to pull back, of course. So that needs to go in your momentum list. Let's see what happens on a pullback. Pets as a short. I actually like it as a long. I think it's in the landry list, but we'll go ahead and take a look at it. Now, keep in mind when you're trading a transitional pattern. It's either a deep pullback or the beginning of something. It can be an inflection point. 
So like that ACGL, that was pretty obvious, okay? The overall market was pretty obvious. You make new highs, you implode, you have this little bit of a pullback. When you have a stock that rallies up and then has a deep retrace and then starts to come up a little bit, it's at an inflection point. So it's a big question mark. Is it going to go higher or is it going to lower? And I've actually, in some cases, looked to get long a stock and when it stalls out, actually go the other way. So what do we have here in pets? It ran out really, really nicely. It made a really deep retrace, okay? And then it's trying to rally out of that pullback. So I hear you, but I would I would be looking, at least at this point, believe it or not, to get long this stock, maybe above 36 or above this high, whatever that is. But I hear you. It looked like it does look like it could be a trouble, but keep in mind that you do have some support down here. So if it does trigger, it might find support below. Okay. Go back to like that ACGL, BLDR was another one that comes to mind. What was before that? PAGS was a short that was actually before all this mess began. All of those were coming off of serious, serious highs. BLDR, for instance. You know, you're coming off of all-time highs. You've got nothing below it for a long, long time. No really support at all. Just rolls over and implodes. Kind of a textbook type of setup there, okay? So that's what you want to be looking at on the short side. H, Z, and P. That's going to be Horizon, I think. Yeah, uh, you know, one thing I'm seeing here is it is losing a little momentum, okay? Ideally you shorter term okay longer term i hear you because it's it's like well you could argue that it's kind of going straight up but shorter term it's lost a little bit of steam so i would pay attention to that but let's see what it looks like after it sets up i wouldn't toss it out completely but I, I don't i think you need to find something that that isn't losing steam shorter term f v r r fiber yeah it looks fantastic that's on my momentum list for sure not set up just yet, but it, it could set up soon. So wait for that pullback. Super duper high HV, even with this persistent move higher, still is a crazy HV, right? But yeah, that looks fantastic. And that is on my momentum list. I'd be willing to bet a beer on that. AEIS for Elizabeth. AEIS. Uh, no, too much overhead supply. Okay. Looks like I've got it drawn in from last week. Okay. We gotta get we gotta get you away from these overhead supply stocks. Elizabeth, but I hear you. I mean, it's it's in a trend, but no, it's better out there. As a, the lesson we just gave, going through all those stocks with open air. Yeah, you know, here's another one. Put it in your momentum list. HV114, crazy, 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 okay? I mean, here's the case here with this little TKO bar. Just, just not enough for me, given the nature of this move. This thing doubled over a fairly short period of time. More than doubled, right? What did it do? Almost 200%. Okay. So maybe a little bit knockout move, more knockout move on that one, Stuart. Dirt, what are you doing here? Ring, did we talk about that one? Yeah, we talked about that one. KBAL is a short. Uh, I'm going to say no. Uh, I hear you. Bigger picture wise, it's kind of a retrace and it's died out. It doesn't look good, but it's sort of going sideways in here for quite a while. You know, this is probably like a weekly setup. Yeah, in a weekly chart, it looks okay. If you're short, stay short, but I wouldn't short it at this juncture. Also, let's not forget, if we're gonna short something, what do we want? We want stupid high volume. It's only 140,000 on average volume, especially on a $14 stock or $10 stock. You can get a lot of trouble really fast. Jcom is a short. J C-O-M. No, once again, we've got just sideways action. I mean, I hear you shorter term. It's kind of like a micro little first thrust lower and a little pullback, but I would leave that alone. In fact, I'm not actually seeing any decent shorts right now because the market has pulled back for so many days, okay? So I would leave that alone. Spot, I looked at this last week on a pullback. S-H asterisk T, maybe on another pullback. S-P-O-T. Yeah, I mean, I really did. I wouldn't beat yourself up too much, and that's the thing. You got to be careful. Hindsight obviously is twenty twenty. Okay, first of all, it really didn't get out of this range too much. I guess it, it's okay looking as a cup and handle. Let's see if it's at all time levels. I mean, it's okay, but 
I, I certainly wouldn't look at this and say I should have gotten that trade. I should have gotten the PDD, okay? Beat yourself up or something like that. But something like this, eh, it just doesn't really jump out at me as a something you should have gotten, okay? We got another write in. Dave, can you please help me look at the chart on NVIDIA? All right. Okay. It seems to me that the stock is forming a really nice bottom, W around bottom and a break to new high, NVDA. Okay. It should be very bullish. Why is the stock sold off today? Why did it sell off today? I know that there's earnings today. From a technical perspective, the stock has formed a really nice base. Can the stock fall even though the technicals the technical is strong? Absolutely. Of course it can. Okay. Look at that one we just showed a few minutes ago that was going straight up. And then what happened? It lost 73% overnight. Okay. Yeah. Anything can happen. This is why I don't feel the technical signals are trustworthy. Well, okay. It depends on what you're doing from a technical standpoint. Now, when I say technical analysis, I'm using the charts to read the psychology of the market and try to figure out a way to get into charts to take advantage of the psychology of the market. So for instance, the trend knockout pattern, I was talking to the gentleman I was talking to yesterday, he's buying stocks going to the new highs, which is, not a, which is not a horrible thing to do, but you're much better off waiting for something like a trend knockout type of move where the Johnny come lately's the last people to buy are knocked out of the market and then look to get long. Now, this stock is an HV of 100, round numbers. I wouldn't call a three-point drop in a $355 stock a sell-off, okay? <laughs> that's just a, with a Cajun say, that's like a fart in a window unit, you know? That's nothing. But yeah, it has broken out to new highs and has pulled back a little bit. I don't see a double bottom. I don't see these other things you talked about. So uh, we would, uh, Ivy, we'd have to take a look at that in a little bit more detail. So if you don't mind, if you're watching this or watching the recording of this on YouTube, do me a favor, shoot me an email or shoot me another email, but put the chart in there and mark it up for me so I could see what you're looking at and we could pick it apart further. But yeah, this thing is broken out. Maybe on a pullback, it might be worthwhile. And believe me, you know, technicals and my methodology is not the be all end all. You're not going to catch every stock. You will be wrong quite a lot. Okay. It just comes with the territory. Okay. I recently bought IPO GAN on May 12th, as did I, Stuart. <laughs> but it stopped out on May 14th, as did I, Stuart. <laughs> GAN now appears that it could be setting up again for a buy. All right. Let's look at that first before I get to the rest of your question. All right, so I bought this mofo and lost my ass, okay? Truth be told, right? I hate people to say, I'm going to be honest with you. Well, you've been lying to me this whole time. So, But every now and then I find myself wanting to say that, so I have to say, truth be told. So I bought this, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I liked it right here, and I was all over it. Unfortunately, within a couple of days, I lost an S ton of money and very upset. Dropped an F-bomb or two, or three, or four, or five. Now, when would I buy it again? I think it might be worth going back after with a couple of caveats, as we've talked about before, and I'm, it should be behind the members area somewhere. I think I've actually made it public before that. But this is a five-day simple moving average. One pattern I like with IPOs is the low being above the five-day simple, in other words, Landry light, and a close at new highs. So let's just say 1550, maybe a little bit higher than that, but thereabouts, and the low greater than the moving average, I would actually take this stock again. If I lose again, I'm gonna drop 15 F-bombs, but I think it might be worth a shot. Maybe I was right, but early. In fact, I'm gonna write a new book, Dave Landry, right but early, the story of my life. <laughs> like I was saying in a chat in the Facebook group, it's my wife's like, you're off to the right but early. Is there anything you can do about that? I'm like, oh baby. If there was, <laughs> we'd be somewhere right now. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, considering the rebuy, could use the same buy patterns for the initial gain, IPOs. No, okay, so this question is, so this was a buy at B setup, okay, which you're buying into new closing highs, and you actually put on the trade on the close. It's a bit of a leap of faith, 
I've come in on Mondays after these trade and curse myself, trades and curse myself. But sometimes stock will be up two, three, four, five points, and I'm taking profits the next day and feeling fantastic about it. So does it always work? Obviously, but when it works, it could be a thing of beauty. I would use I would use something that has a little bit of a momentum characteristic to it. So remember, buy at B. We're just buying that new closing high with the five-day SMA thing, which I I haven't gotten around the name in. And if you guys have a name for that, please let me know. IPO Go or something like that. We got to put my name in it somewhere. My wife's like, why can't you put your name on things like John Bollinger? <laughs> she met Bollinger. Oh, you're Bollinger. <laughs> You are smart. You put your name on things. She doesn't sound like that. She sounds more like Marge Simpson. <laughs> Same buy parameters. Yeah, I would say about three points. Absolutely. But wait for that. Wait for that. I think it's still worth going after on a Pioneer setup. With the IPOs, there's two types of setups. I'll give you a quick lesson for those. Just for those who don't have the course. I think most everybody here does because you're also in my group. So with IPOs, you Pioneer setup, like on a day like here, you're looking to get in early. So let's say a stock comes public, one, two, three, four, and this is day five, with a lot of caveats. But let's say it closes at a new closing high. We're looking to buy that close. Now, there's quite a few caveats again, but this is what I call a pioneer setup. Now, in some cases, like CARR carrier, I didn't take the pioneer setup because I'm thinking like, okay, well, I'm not sure, not to confuse the issue with facts, but I'm not sure that the IPO you know, HVAC company has enough excitement to be able to blast off from something like this. So what I'll do is I'll wait for a secondary setup. In other words, something more generic like a pullback or something, okay? So like on CARR, that's what I'm looking for as opposed to buying it right out. But in this particular case, on this particular stock, without going through all the details because we're running out of time, I would I would actually go after it again, provided of course we have that five day SMA setup. Okay. OPRA. Okay. Oh, is this the company that uh what's the what's the Seinfeld company? They broadcast opera. <laughs> um, it looks okay. Why am I picking it apart? My function keys no longer work. Mother father. Oh, wait a minute. Ah, brain fart. Okay. Yeah, I would actually let it rally up a little bit more. I'd like to see it get past this this peak in here. I mean, it's not horrible. Technically, it's a bow tie, okay? It's just not jumping out of me. And, ah, here's the other problem. Lots of overhead supply. So I would pass based on that, but I hear you. Well, I'm a late bloomer, okay? That's out of context now, so I forget what you were saying. It'd be great if we could, can I sort these things? But, oh my God, I could sort these by who's asking. So maybe maybe now I know. <laughs> All right, CJ. His name is Chris A, but he goes by CJ. Well, that's confusing. Why can't it be CA? <laughs> I'll try to remember that, Chris. <laughs> Love the SNL references. That's because you're not Stuart. <laughs> not sure how many people get the Tidy Elvis reference. That's going back. Uh, look at that chart, it's huge. I was looking for a tiny Elvis the other day and I couldn't find one. And then I realized I was wasted about 40 minutes looking for a tiny Elvis and like, you know, Dave, you got a lot of stuff to do other than trying to find that tiny Elvis. Two points on GAN, uh, I would say three points. It's kind of crazy. That was the price is right. Yeah, it was on the price is right. Okay, I'm gonna get out of Holex. Yeah, I mean, that's the tough part. It's like once you, I don't know, you know, let the market take you out maybe. Just put a stop somewhere and the market takes you out, it takes you out. I don't want to convince you in or out of the stock. I'm a late bloomer. I said the right bird early. <laughs> gotcha. What do you think about PDD for Smitty? Hey, Smitty, good to see you. PDD. I'd like to see a little bit more pullback here. Uh, let's see it by the end of the day, but you're thinking 64. That's a little high because you're giving up that reversion to the mean move. Okay. I would actually like to see it. I'm running out of time. I would actually like to see a slightly deeper pullback. With a pullback, especially in a in a volatile or momentum stock like this, we're trying to capture that reversion to the mean move back in the direction of the trend, okay? So if your entry is way up here towards the old high, by the time it gets all the way up here, 
you may have given up that reversion to the mean move and that might be all you get. And that's why we take those partial profits somewhere within that mer reversion of mean move or just shortly thereafter, depending on the volatility of the stock. So I would actually like to see this pull back a little bit further, but it's, it, I tell you, it's not bad. Uh, but I would make sure I would put the entry maybe let's see maybe somewhere in here somewhere so you have a little bit of room for it to to go back to the highs. But ideally, if I had my rathers like the little southern girl I dated once used to say, uh, she I guess she rathered someone other than me. Thank God. <laughs> but if I had my rathers, I'd like to see it pull back a little bit further. Okay, Nvidia has earnings tonight. Gotcha. Okay. Well, it's not set up, so we don't have to worry about that, right? Became interested in SQ for the wrong reasons, but I see some DL daylight, prefer deeper pullbacks. All right. It's SQ. Yeah, that's the same V shape type of thing I'd prefer to avoid for now, as long as we've got all these other stocks setting up but yeah and it's also it also has become really wide and loose it used to trend reason i back the chart out because i remember this one used to really trend nicely but now it hasn't trended as much a d c t as a buy ID. somebody's doing their homework yeah absolutely let's see okay okay first of all buy it b above twenty dollars remember those caveats we talked about so we're going to have to decide on whether or not we still want to go after it one two three four five I kind of like it. Uh, we'll have to check the spreads on it, even though it's it's violating that twenty dollar rule. I mean, everything's kind of crazy now. But yeah, that this will this would definitely come up in my. I do a scan about thirty minutes before the close to see if there's any buy at these. I'm going to give this one a strong maybe. I have to do a little bit more research. The only thing that has me a little concerned is I'd actually like to see. It's only made like a five point run which is substantial, don't get me wrong, but I'd like to see a little bit more range in it for that first opening week. But it's certainly not bad, and I'm, I think I might have to give you a high five on that one. Elizabeth says, thanks for answering my questions. Oh, no problem, Elizabeth. Okay, we're out of time, but we could do one more maybe, going once, going twice. All right, well, I wanna thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Any other answered questions, daviddavelair.com, or better, better yet, bring them up in the Facebook group so we can get to them right away, and we can all sort of noodle with them a little bit, and you'll probably get a better answer there. Everybody have a great weekend. I think it's Memorial Day weekend. It's all a blur now. I have no idea, but I think it's Memorial Day weekend. So everybody have a great holiday weekend, and hopefully we'll see all you guys and girls again next week, God willing, at least. Stay safe, stay sane, and may the trend be with you.